So welcome everyone today. This is our very first luminary session of the SMRA. And today we have one of our a great hosts that I've had the pleasure of working with, Dr. Charles Mistretta. And what this is gonna be is we're gonna ask him a host of questions that were fielded from the early career committee. And we'll get his ideas kind of what he's been involved with and geography and hopefully we'll learn a thing or two from him as well. So kind of starting this off, um, the Society of Magnetic Resonance and Geography was founded around 1989. It was, was really a way to bring scientists, clinicians, and industry together with this common interest with MR and geography. Now, what was your initial introduction to angiographic imaging? Well, the first thing I got involved with was uh, digital subtraction angiography in the x-ray world. And uh, that happened back in the late 70s. And uh, I began working with uh, Dr. Andrew Crummy, Charles Struther, and Joseph Sackett. And um, that evolved, uh, you know, gradually and with a lot of input from other centers like the University of Arizona, Keele Kinder Clinic, uh, some film subtraction and geography work in Toulouse, France. And that inspired us to change a, a device which had been originally built for been built for um, digital uh, k-edge imaging into a time subtraction device um, and we used that turned it into a uh, what eventually became a, a prototype digital subtraction and geography device and placed it on, in our hospital uh, i would say that the uh, collaboration with dr crummy uh, was very important to me i was a high energy physicist who had just changed into uh, radiology and medical imaging. I really didn't know much. In fact, he taught me that arterial anastomosis was not the guy who married Jackie Kennedy. And uh, <laughs> so that collaboration uh, went on for years and years. And uh, of course, digital subtraction and geography was introduced in 1980 at the RSNA. And uh, that evolved and uh, into what became a, a pretty important uh, introduction. Excellent. And how did you become involved with the SMRA community, actually? Well, uh, after being in x-ray for a long time, I said to myself, gee, wouldn't it be fun to learn some MR? <laughs> so, uh, I, in fact, I went to, uh, to Willie Callender, who was my former student, and said, Willie, I think, I think CT is dead, which, of course, was wrong. And I said, why don't we go off and learn some MR together? He says, well, I think there might still be some things to do in, uh, in uh, CT, after which he was nominated for the Nobel Prize for spiral CT. <laughs> so, so much for my prognostications. But I did go into MRA. I started going to uh, what was then the MRA club. Um, and of course, in those days, things were... Uh, non-time resolved. There had been some great work by Chuck Dumoulin in uh, phase contrast, Gerhard Laub in time of flight, um, but it was all non-time resolved. Uh, but I started going to the MRA meeting. Eventually, Tom Grist uh, suggested that there ought to be a, an MR analog of DSA, a time resolved DSA, because the problem was in those days that when you did a contrast enhanced injection, um, and the timing was critical. And if you didn't get the center of case space when there was adequate contrast, you'd get very bad images. So he conceived of a time resolve sequence where you'd have a choice of where to take your images and you'd always get the center of case space. So um, I ran with that idea and implemented it on a uh, platform called Alice. And that seemed to work. So Frank Korosek then uh, implemented it very quickly. And of course, it became a, uh, a clinical, a helpful tool. Excellent. Yeah, great. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you came from this high energy physicist background and really brought, got brought into this medical imaging area of field of research. Uh, when did you feel kind of that you'd become established in medical imaging? Well, I think it was... Uh, um, after DSA got running and we started getting clinical evaluations that were favorable. I should tell you a little story about John Cameron, who was my kind of physics mentor. I was a high energy physicist with limited theoretical capabilities. And my, my greatest asset, I, asset was I could uh, stack uh, shielding bricks, lead bricks. 
And so <laughs> after uh, three years as a postdoc in high energy physics at uh, Wisconsin, I found out there probably wasn't going to be a spot for me in high energy physics. So I went uh, to, to interview with John Cameron, and uh, he asked me what my thesis project was, and I said, electron proton scattering. He said, do you think you could do medical imaging? And I said, what's that? He says, it's x-ray people scattering. I said, yeah, I think I know how to do that. So, and that's how it all started. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Now, along your journey through both academic and professional career, were there any like road roadblocks that you encountered maybe that you didn't anticipate along the way? No, I have to say that I was really blessed. Uh, I had a lot of support from the radiology department chairs and radiology colleagues and my physics colleagues. And being at the University of Wisconsin was a, a real blessing. So I got a lot more help than discouragement and everything really went went very well. That's great. It's great to hear. Um, so I think many people have known that you both played the role as a student, but as a great mentor. Uh, you've had numerous PhD students as well as postdoctoral associates. Um, what are some qualities that you would look for when selecting a potential new addition to your lab? Well, you know, at, at the UW is almost automatic because uh, we have a nice selection process and all of the students who uh, get admitted to our program are really highly qualified and inevitably have better computer skills than I do. <laughs> so uh, I can pick and have picked almost anyone who was interested and they've all been uh, very successful. The postdocs uh, sometimes come uh, through our own program after getting their PhD in my group, for example, a lot of them proceed to the postdoctoral level. But I also, uh, at, the, at, at the MRA club, got to hear people like Sean Fain and others from Steve Reeder's group and uh, managed to lure them to come to, uh, to Wisconsin. So the MRA club uh, was a good way to scout out some really good postdoc candidates. I think the UW is very uh, happy for your scouting abilities from the <laughs> SMRA. <laughs> now, uh, through your life as a researcher, life can get pretty busy, you know, filled with late nights at the MR or completing nonstop grant writing, paper writing, and countless meetings that you have to attend. Um, how do you cope with that busy lifestyle? What are some things that you use? Well, first of all, I'm doing something I always have been doing something that I love to do. Uh, so that helps you cope. But I've also had the uh, support and companionship of, of Darlene, my wife, uh, who's been my best friend for 70 years. And uh, that kind of support in her managing our family life and our travel and all that sort of thing has really been very helpful. I've also done uh, my share of fishing and golfing and music and those sorts of things. So it's been a, it's really been a pleasure. Were there any times where maybe you found that the balance was off between them and you had to kind of readjust? Well, I always gave the family first priority and uh, that didn't interfere with the work, but that was always my first priority and uh, uh, I would do it again that way. Excellent. Now, I think you're an idea machine, as many people know, um, any meeting you, present an idea and you already moved on to the, to the next three while we're still figuring out the first one. Um, <laughs> where, where have you found the most success with generating new ideas? And is there any idea, uh, advice you would give researchers earlier in their careers? Yeah, well, I think it's important uh, to establish collaborations with uh, clinical people. And Tom Grist has been a, a really big uh, source of ideas for me. Uh, so establish, good relationships, uh, get input from people who know what the problems are that need to be solved. Another thing I would say, uh, I've said this many times to young people, is that when you're trying to figure out a, uh, an improvement or something to make the world better in imaging, don't look at what there is at present and try to make an incremental change. Say to yourself, what would I do if I could start all over again and do it the right way? and just jump to that and try something even it's a little bizarre. Uh, it's always fun to try something totally new. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. It's hard to start from a 
basic building blocks or from nothing and create your own blocks to make something new. But <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I get inspirations from other colleagues like uh, Jurgen Hennig has been a real inspiration. I, I, my whole career has been sort of built around uh, accelerated imaging and trying to go faster and get more SNR and more spatial resolution and violate the Nyquist theorem <laughs> as much as I could. And uh, it, I think it was in 2005, Jurgen Hennig presented a lecture where he said, if we, if, if everything in the angiographic image stayed the same, you could get a time resolve series just by collecting the center of case space uh, each time. And that, well, that led me on to thinking about uh, constrained reconstruction, which eventually led to the uh, hyper. And combining that with, uh, with uh, radial imaging, which was also kind of a radical thing, combining those two let us get up to a factor of 1,000 violation of the Nyquist theorem. So we really got going very, very fast. Throughout your career, I think many people know that you've collaborated with a numerous amount of labs and people, um, and many of them are still involved with the SMRA. So what are your thoughts on collaborations and ones that have really worked the most successfully for you? For me, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with the clinical people at Wisconsin a lot, and that's worked very well, and that's always the easiest thing to do. But I've also had good collaborations with uh, the people up at Mayo, for example, and most recently in CT, where they've supplied us with uh, CTA, CTA images for our uh, coronary artery velocity measurement. And uh, we're presently collaborating with them on a technique to reduce CT fluoroscopy dose by a factor of 500 because they happen to have some equipment that we don't have at Wisconsin. So that's been a very good collaboration. So I would advise young people to keep their eyes open for uh, collaborations both in their department and if necessary outside the department. Hmm. Now this might be a question for uh, still early career but focused more on the grant writing. So I think your first grant acceptance was in 1985, and there was dozens to follow after throughout your career. Uh, what skills have you found most important in the grant writing process? That's a tough one. I've had a lot of grants turned down, but uh, in general, you want to have a, a proposal that has relevance, something that's going to make a clinical difference. Uh, you want to propose some well-defined and understandable specific aims. You want to design typically um, simulations, phantom experiments, animal experiments, and sometimes go on to, to the uh, human experiments. So um, lots of times you'll send in a grant and you won't quite make it, and then the reviewers will come back with suggestions. Most of the time these suggestions are well-intentioned, and uh, most of the time I can remember we usually would score on the second time around. So you want to be persistent, don't get discouraged, and try to make it better. Try to make it simple so it's understandable. Right. Yeah, so you mentioned um, that I think everyone's experienced a grant refusal. Um, what were some difficulties that you encountered, I guess, with this grant process? Well, being refused hits your ego <laughs> a little bit <laughs> for, a, for a while. And then most of the time when you go back and read the grant, you say, oh my gosh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make that very clear. So, uh, you know, every time you write the grant, it does get better. Having a career focused on the development of really time-resolved angiographic imaging um, with creations such as Trix, Viper, and Hyper, um, what do you see as the current largest hurdle or limitation of, that really needs to be met to allow us to go even faster with these MRA techniques? Well, I've been a little bit frustrated throughout my career at, at uh, the time it takes industry to implement the things that I've come up with. Um, uh, you know, I've advocated using radial imaging and constrained reconstruction like hyper and so on. And with those, you can go so much faster with high SNR and high spatial resolution than the current commercial products. Uh, but the commercial firms are, are more comfortable using conventional Cartesian acquisition with perhaps parallel imaging. And with that, they've been able to get very good clinical results. So 
I don't think they see a pressing need to go faster in, in MRA. They're already getting good clinical results. So, so I'm a little bit frustrated that we've got all these things that are ultra super fast, but they probably will never be implemented. Now, on that point, I would say that I think you've had success in translating multiple imaging techniques to this widespread clinical use. Um, I think you've mentioned one of the cons, but could you talk about maybe a pros and cons when translating these ideas to the clinic? Well, you know, I think that going back and forth between x-ray and MR and CT is a very useful uh, thing. For example, um, using Hyper, which was originally um, designed for MRA, we now can get 2,500 CTA images per second just doing a hyper CTA. And once we get there, we can then start measuring coronary artery velocities and pressures. So that's definitely a, a pro in terms of translating ideas from one uh, imaging modality to another. Uh, I don't see any contraindications at the moment, except that it's going to take the manufacturers uh, a lot of time to uh, produce apparatus that do the sorts of things we want. For example, I, I envision a standalone CT device that can do low-dose fluoroscopy and do uh, quantitative coronary angiography and intervention all in one device instead of these combined C-arm, CT systems, and so on. It's going to take a long time for that sort of thing to, to evolve. You have a very unique experience uh, in your career because you've been bouncing back and forth between both X-ray and MR angiographic imaging developments. How has this really helped, helped your academic career? And did you find any limitations by splitting your time between these different modalities? Well, you know, I really didn't jump out of uh, uh, from X-ray into MR until probably I was a full professor. <laughs> so <laughs> I was, I had tenure, I felt safe. So I was, I felt free to, uh, to do some weird things without <laughs> losing my job. So <laughs> that's one good thing about academia and, and a, a plus for the, the tenure system. <laughs> All right. And I think even though this is for the Society of Magnetic Resonance Angiography, uh, I think it's very important still to mention your role for digital subtraction angiography and how this still plays a critical role in uh, currently worldwide with clinical imaging. At what point did you realize the potential of your work? And does this current version of digital subtraction angi angiography really match kind of your initial vision of the idea? The initial vision for digital subtraction angiography was as a non-invasive intravenous diagnostic technique. And uh, once that was commercially introduced, it turned out that not everybody could pull that off and get really good images consistently because of motion and other things. So very quickly after the introduction of that equipment, people started doing low dose contrast injections intraarterially. And that had the advantages that you got better images consistently. And if you wanted to do an intervention, the catheter was already in place. So that was the point at which interventional angiography really became uh, clinically, well, it was accelerated for sure. You are definitely well known in your accomplishments for both in x-ray and in MR communities. Uh, what do you feel that is your biggest contribution to angiographic imaging? And could you mention maybe a project that was maybe overshadowed by some of your bigger accomplishments that you'd like to highlight? Well, I, th I think DSA is the one, and, and TRIX, which is the MR version of, of, of DSA. I think those are the two biggest contributions. A lot of the other things were perhaps fun and games, trying to see how badly we could violate <laughs> the Nyquist theorem and how fast we could go. Uh, but those, those efforts, although they were lots of fun and are still there lurking, uh, it's unlikely that the commercial companies are going to implement those. So that's been a little bit of a, a downer for me, but uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun doing those things. And now maybe a, a little more controversial question. If you had to pick MR or X-ray, angiographic imaging, which one would you pick? Pick for what? <laughs> <laughs> the rest of your career to spend your time on, if you had to do one. 
Well, I, I think right now the greatest potential, I mean, MR has never really uh, finished the job with the coronary angiography because of spatial resolution and so on. So I think that CTA um, has got the potential to provide high resolution images and all the quantitative information. And as I said, eventually produce a platform uh, where you can do uh, intervention and diagnosis while the patient's on the table very quickly and get the whole job done. So I think my last uh, few projects here, or at least for the next few years, <laughs> if I'm so lucky, will probably be with the, uh, the CTA coronary angiography and low dose fluoroscopy. Now, if you could travel back in time and meet yourself at the beginning of your career, what advice would you give yourself? I would take a shorter backswing. <laughs> <laughs> I always get quite Nishimura uh, that his backswing is too uh, too long. Uh, we enjoyed <laughs> playing golf together over the years, and uh, I don't know if Dwight's still playing, but because of my back, I'm not. But I think my career would have been better if I'd taken a shorter backswing. <laughs> All right, I think you mentioned some ideas of um, maybe where the future of MR angiography is going. So w what do you envision is the next step for angiographic imaging, specifically for MRI? Well, I, I think it's in pretty good shape. We, we have time-resolved MRA, uh, maybe more quantitation, but uh, uh, I, I think we've done a pretty good job in bringing it uh, to a good clinical level. I mean, uh, they haven't always used the techniques I've recommended. Uh, I mean, people like Steve Reeder have always done a great job uh, optimizing uh, what could be done uh, practically and uh, acceptably to the manufacturers and, and conducted uh, lots of good solid clinical uh, tests to make sure it works. So I think the MRA uh, has done, SMRA has done a great job in, in uh, consistently refining the clinical uh, results. Um, and uh, I'm very, very happy to see that. Now, if you could select the next location for the SMRA to be held, what, what's kind of a top, top location that you would pick? <laughs> you know, one of the great things about the SMRA is all the beautiful uh, venues that we've had. I mean, Darlene and I have been to probably 25 of them, made lifelong friends. In fact, the women uh, still uh, do Zooms every second Tuesday. They've become very, very good friends. And of course, their spouses are, are more very good friends and colleagues. So it, it's been a, a, a very great uh, thing for for establishing friendships and, and seeing the world. I don't know where I'd want to go back to right, uh, right now, somewhere where they didn't have COVID, I suppose. <laughs> That's a fair enough. <laughs> yeah. And I guess one final question, uh, if this is kind of a highlight, whatever you want. Um, so any words of advice that you would like to share with the SMRA community or any um, new ideas of research that you would like to see people kind of go into? And once again, I would encourage the young people to think about things that could really make a big difference. Don't go for a, don't go for a 10 or 20 percent difference. Look for factors of two or three at least and uh, just do things that are a little risky and uh, in general, uh, those will be more fun and if they pay off, you will have made a good difference. Well, thank you so much for your time and participating with the SMRA Luminary interview and being on the first one. Um, I hope they continue along and we, you can see a whole host of other friends that you've made from the SMRA. Thank you.